Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the cue. <laughs> okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Jalasi, and bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, my name is Richard Eisner. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research and Graduate Studies, and also the Acting Director of the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. And I'd like to welcome all our guests joining us online this afternoon for the Brian Mulroney Institute Fellows Lecture. I'd like to begin this afternoon's program with a territorial land acknowledgement. St. Francis Xavier University stands on the lands of Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded home of the Mi'kmaq. We express our deep gratitude and appreciation to the generations of Mi'kmaq who, since time immemorial, have loved and stewarded these lands and the beings that call them home. Colonization is not just history, it exists in the present tense. While we strive to decolonize ourselves and our university, we know there is still much for us to learn. We are committed to doing the hard work of self-reflection and to repairing relationships with the Mi'kmaq on whose lands we reside, including embracing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and embodying their spirits, spirit in our day-to-day -day lives. We are all treaty people. The Brian Mulroney Institute of Government is honored to welcome Dr. Lavinia Stan, Research Fellow, to speak with us this afternoon as part of our Fellows Lecture Series. Dr. Stan is Professor of Political Science at St. of X. She is a comparative politics specialist, widely recognized as a leading expert on Romania and the post-communist world. Dr. Stan has conducted research and published on transitional justice, religion and politics and post-communist democratization. More recently, her work is focused on the way in which religious groups have reckoned or not with their communist past and with their involvement uh, with those repressive regimes. She is the author or editor of 15 books and numerous articles and book chapters, including Transitional Justice in Post-Communist Romania, the Politics of Memory in 2013, Post-Communist Transitional Justice Lessons from 25 Years of Experience in 2015, and Transitional Justice in the Former Soviet Union, Reviewing the Past and Looking Towards the Future, published in 2018. Dr. Stan is also the co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Transitional Justice, which is now in its second edition. Her work has been funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and granting agencies from other countries. Dr. Stan is past president of the Society for Romanian Studies. She has also served as a member of the Scientific Council of the Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crimes and the Memory of Romanian Exile, a transitional justice institution located in Bucharest, Romania. The title of Lavinia's talk this afternoon is Transitional Justice for Ukraine, Challenges and Possibilities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lavinia Stan this afternoon. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, um, for showing up today. Uh, I understand that uh, we will have some snow later. So this is quite courageous of you. Um, there have been uh, um, a number of discussions lately, if you follow the news, uh, how we move once the war in Ukraine is over how we move to prosecute people for their involvement in uh, human rights violations. Uh, and this is exactly up my alley. This is exactly what I'm doing. Transitional justice um, uh, talks about uh, these issues. So what I want today is to um, broaden up a little bit the discussion about transitional justice uh, after the war in Ukraine and uh, um, explain why this is a good case for us, the transitional justice community, uh, besides the fact that I will have a very good career until I uh, uh, retire because there are plenty of uh, human rights violations around to talk about, uh, but also what kind of um, uh, limitations and problems this particular case raises to the transitional justice project and transitional justice theory, yeah? Okay, uh, because usually uh, when I talk about transitional justice, uh, somebody in the audience is transnational justice or whatever. I'm, I'm starting by explaining 
Oh, okay, yeah. donkey. Oh, I flip it over. This. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I have to start by explaining what transitional justice is. Yeah. Um, there are many definitions there. We uh, the the term itself uh, was mentioned uh, for the first time in the 1990s by a guy named Neil Kritz. Uh, then uh, Ruti Taitel, who is a professor of law at the University of at New York University, uh, published. A book with Oxford University Press, Transitional Justice. Um, but then we uh, today we have a special rapporteur for transitional justice at the UN and um, uh, governments in the world and uh, the international community is very committed to these things. So pretty much in two decades, we've, uh, we've arrived yeah, from uh, nothing to something. And uh, uh, as uh, Catherine Sikind uh, is uh, saying, we are living in a justice cascade. Um, type of um, a world where everybody's copying everybody else and thinking about uh, methods to reckon with the past. So transitional justice uh, uh, means action, policies, methods, practices adopted by uh, governments, but also sometimes by civil society in an effort to reckon with um, recent past violations. Um, uh, and this recent past uh, means that we are not uh, looking back at the gladiators, for example. Uh, usually we start with the Nuremberg trials, but uh, we also look at the Armenian genocide, which happened in uh, 1915. That's not that recent, yeah. So kind of it's, a, it's, a, um, um, it's an evolving um, um, area with um, more and more cases being added. What we do to reckon with this legacy of human rights violations is to engage with a toolbox of transitional justice, yeah? Um, and um, this means that um, we can, um, we can uh, uh, set up uh, trust commissions. Sometimes they are set up like in uh, Canada by, the, by government uh, officials. Uh, sometimes they are set up by uh, civil society groups. We can uh, engage in lustration, which is the control type of purge, of vetting. Yeah, uh, denazification was an executive driven type of cleansing of your public administration and uh, um, uh, political offices of uh, collaborators with the, with the Nazi regime. Yeah, but because it was an executive thing, you didn't have the opposition. Yeah. Uh, involved in this decision. Lustration is always a, uh, uh, a law passed by parliament where you have both the ruling party and the opposition commenting on it. Yeah, uh, We can have uh, access to the files compiled by uh, intelligence services. Access to secret files is very important. Is uh, uh, I've done work uh, quite a bit uh, on it. Access um, um, given to ordinary citizens, not to historians. Yeah, I always tell my students, yeah, we give historians 100 years, they will write the best books, the most detailed about whatever past human rights crime you want to reckon with, yeah? That's not what I'm interested in. I will be long dead by then. That's not politically driven. It has no, no bearing on me. This is why we are using political impetus, a political involvement, yeah, in these transitional justice uh, methods to bring them forward so that they deliver, the truth commissions have to deliver quite quickly, yeah, uh, a truth that is never the complete truth, but it has implications on the way the society is looking at the past, on the way the uh, perpetrators are identified, on the way the victims are given compensation or whatever, yeah, and recognition. 
Restitution of property, uh, if you have property confiscated, that's another way to reckon, to, to reverse the legacy of, the, of these recent pasts. Um, compensation packages, uh, huge in Latin America with the disappeared, yeah, uh, because when you kill the, or you disappear the breadwinner, then the entire family is uh, placed uh, at a um, uh, disadvantage. Um, rehabilitation of former political prisoners, this is very important, a gulag, uh, former gulag uh, inmates, yeah, uh, who were uh, um, maybe driven through a court proceeding, accusing them of, uh, you know, dabbling in uh, foreign currency or in prostitution. And actually, actually, their case was a political case. They are in, they were in the gulag because of their political opposition to the Soviet regime. Um, and then you have to, after they come out, you have to redress them to a position uh, before, before they, um, uh, they were targeted by the repressive regime. Reintegration of former combatants. We had recently on campus a child soldier, yeah? uh, one of the easiest cases, I would say, one of the, one of the child soldiers who are very, for a very limited uh, um, uh, period of time, uh, he was, uh, um, uh, drafted. That's also important because unless you reintegrate them into the uh, community, you have to demilitarize them. You have to take their uh, their weapons, but also you have to convince them that they have a stake in the community, and you have to convince the community that they must they must continue to live there. Rewriting history textbooks is also very important. Uh, a lot of historians are uh, involved in this uh, because if you get to the new generations, then you you can you can uh, pretty much uh, raise them in another uh, framework, yeah, uh, regarding the um, uh, the past human rights uh, uh, abuses, unofficial truth projects, Ramhi, where they. Uh, for example, in Brazil, they uh, they produced a group of lawyers produced a copy of uh, government uh, documents uh, that was then uh, shipped to the World Council of Churches. And based on those copies of documents, they could establish a case against the dictatorship. Yeah, uh, memorialization is a huge basket that includes everything that has to do with memory, like uh, knocking down statues. Yeah, and we have here an entire discussion about the Confederation uh, statues, yeah. Um, erecting new sta statues, uh, um, naming and renaming street, uh, streets and localities. We don't have a Leningrad around, we don't have a Stalingrad around. Uh, in uh, Tirana, one friend of mine uh, uh, who was uh, teaching at the University of Toronto was saying that in the early 1990s, one third of all the streets had no name because of course they were related to communism. They knew exactly, the population knew exactly what they didn't want, communism around, yeah? But they couldn't agree what they wanted, yeah. In Romania, they gave uh, flowers, yeah, flowers, trees, stuff, uh, yeah. These are the new, uh, the new uh, names. Statues, uh, streets and localities, um, uh, exhibitions, um, monuments, um, museums. All of this has to do with memory, and we call it memorialization. So this is pretty much what we do in transitional justice and trying to. Uh, come up with proposals of uh, uh, what are the feasible um, methods out of this uh, toolkit that might deliver truth, justice, reconciliation, and guarantees of non-repetition in the case of various pasts yeah, uh, marked by uh, human rights violations. But the most important method of reckoning with the past are court trials. Huh? Uh, and that's because uh, usually the victims will say it's not, it's not enough 
for me to get an apology or recognition from the government. I want to see that the former victim uh, victimizers are making compelled to assume responsibility for, for what they, they've done. Also because that's a learning process for the victimizers. Yeah, they, uh, this way you will, uh, you will make sure that they do not re-victimize, yeah? So these court trials uh, in transitional justice can be uh, conducted in local courts. Gachacha in Rwanda are uh, seen as, uh, as uh, uh, an extraordinary type of uh, uh, court trials. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot transport them in another country because they are not accepted in other, um, uh, other contexts. But national courts, I would say that 80% of all reckoning through courts takes place in national courts not international courts, although here the discussion revolves around these international courts. So when it comes to international courts, we have different types there. We had during the 1990s two ad hoc, they are called international criminal tribunals set up by UN for Rwanda and Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, they were very expensive, very inefficient and very slow. So uh, in 1998, uh, the UN uh, and Canada was instrumental in this, um, kind of decided through the Rome Statute that we need to have not an ad hoc, so with, with given jurisdiction over this or that conflict, but a permanent, a permanent ICC, International Criminal Court, that will see situations. It can see only situations. And how we define these situations, it's another thing, yeah? Um, so ICC will, as you will see, it's very important for my narrative here, uh, but not the only important uh, venue. Um, and also uh, not very known are the so-called hybrid courts. International courts are seen as remote, yeah? Because they are somewhere far from the theater of war, it's called, yeah? So the victims cannot go there to listen. The victimizers might, uh, you know, like Milosevic, in, instead of being killed in Yugoslavia and, uh, you know, he goes to The Hague and he dies in luxury compared to the Yugoslavs uh, left behind, yeah? So uh, international courts are good, but they are not as good as we might think. So this is why in some situations, uh, the international community chooses to bring the international court closer to the national setting with these hybrid courts that, uh, that um, combine um, uh, national and international funding, personnel, uh, um, uh, legal standards, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are pretty much the methods of transitional justice that I have in mind when I'm looking at any case, including the case of, of the war in, uh, in Ukraine, yeah? Now, the war in Ukraine, uh, it's a big, big thing. Yeah, it uh, started in 2014 uh, with the Euromaidan. In reaction, Russia occupied Crimea. We have uh, six deaths uh, we can document related to that uh, occupation. But then we have, through all these years, we have the war in Donbas. This is the oblast uh, in the east of uh, Ukraine where uh, uh, Russian troops uh, maintain a presence. Um, uh, uh, since 2014, and I've tried to come up with uh, with the latest uh, estimates, but uh, uh, it's it's a shooting target in a way. It's a moving target. Yeah, um, uh, between uh, uh, 14 14,000 um, uh, Ukrainian civilians and soldiers killed in the war in Donbas, around uh, 6,500 pro-Russian forces killed, and between uh, 400 and 500 Russian soldiers killed in Donbas. Now, since 
um, since February 2022, we have this more targeted or more all over the place, you can say, depending on the, yeah, some people are saying it's, uh, it makes no sense because the military strategy is so is so out of whack with uh, everything that uh, uh, that the militaries uh, the the commanders uh, think it's it's an effective type of of uh, um, you know um, instilling aggression uh, against uh, ukraine um, there are different different um, estimates uh, put out by the un uh, the ukrainian government has some estimates then you have the uh, organization for security and cooperation in europe uh, they have another set of estimates it's a uh, it, it matters very much whom you listen to. Uh, but on the uh, conservative, um, um, you know, uh, estimate, you can say that in terms of civilians, um, around uh, 8,000 uh, <clears throat> were killed, including 430 children, 13,000 uh, uh, were wounded, uh, 120,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed or wounded, uh, 200,000, but you cannot, uh, there is no way to, to verify these numbers, yeah? And I, I, do, I do believe that they are a bit inflated because they are coming from, from uh, the Ukrainian government. Russian soldiers killed and wounded, destroyed buildings, um, lots of cases of, um, of uh, uh, sexual assault, of, uh, of rape, of torture, of these uh, chambers organized in, uh, in uh, basements of uh, uh, different houses where we have, we have evidence, yeah, when when you see that the person has uh, uh, their hands tied, yeah, that's that's a that's a sign of uh, of systematic uh, torture. And um, we have also the testimonials coming from people from uh, the occupied uh, areas, but also from uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees that were able to arrive in uh, European Union uh, uh, countries. Yeah, uh, Bucha is probably the best known because what we've done in the case of the war in Ukraine, and probably we didn't do to the same extent in other cases uh, where transitional justice is a good method to, to um, get to the victims and victimizers, is that the international community sent um, um, teams of uh, investigators, legal experts, to collect um, uh, evidence that is good enough to be uh, used in a court of law later on. So pretty much now it's this um, uh, amassing of, of the details, documenting, documenting the human rights violations that will later be um, talked about in various, uh, in various courts. Now, for me, do I speak a little bit too, uh, too um, uh, quickly? Huh? Um, for, for us, when it comes to transitional justice, the war in Ukraine is a golden opportunity. Uh, and because for transitional justice, all wars, if you, if you uh, prepare, before the moment when you have to deploy transitional justice methods are a good opportunity to strengthen your toolkit, to, to think about your limitations and to think about what, how, how you can be creative to tailor your transitional justice program to the situation in the, you know, in the, in the theater of war, yeah? So um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity because, as I said, this is the first time when it's a concerted, systematic effort to document crimes way before yeah, there was any indictment on the table. Yeah? There, there was any discussion about 
putting them through through court trials or or you know addressing them with uh, another type of uh, transitional justice method yeah so uh, kind of this uh, shows us that there is a lot of opportunity here for future conflicts yeah and future human rights violations to to prepare ahead rather than uh, you know, um, um, uh, wait for uh, uh, until uh, and until you are invited to to give your opinion about transitional justice. Then it is a golden opportunity for the ICC. And here, the ICC has been under a lot of attack, as you might know. Yeah, uh, it was an institution that uh, during the first 10 years of its, uh, of its uh, existence, uh, because the great powers did not uh, um, endorse it, yeah, and the US signed and then de-signed, unsigned was the, was the name they used, you know, so they, yeah. Um, the ICC has done a tr tremendous, marvelous job to, identify situations around the world. But at the same time, this is the first time when ICC is indicting non-Africans. Yeah? So uh, um, Luis Moreno Ocampo, who was uh, the uh, kid celeb, the, the uh, uh, you know, diva of transitional justice in the world, yeah, as the as the former prosecutor in the trial of the junta in Latin America, um, he was the first prosecutor general of ICC, and of course he had uh, these concerns to um, uh, to consolidate the institution and. And to show the usefulness of ICC. So the way he uh, selected situations in the world was in the end amounted to a um, 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 more emphasis given to African cases. And this is why the second prosecutor general at the ICC was an African uh, uh, judge, um, you know, who, who knew the situation in Africa in a, in, a, in a way for the ICC to get away from this image of an anti-African institution. Yeah, uh, Louis Moreno Ocampo said, well, uh, at the same time, consider the fact that Africa has way more uh, confrontations than any other uh, region you can think of. So this is why it just happens that uh, my situations were only uh, from that uh, area. But now it's, it's the it's the golden opportunity for the ICC to um, show that it doesn't have any Africa bias, anti-Africa anti bias, that uh, if you engage in, in you know, killings and, and nonsensical type of uh, abuse, then ICC is looking at you, it's, is, is targeting you, yeah? So this is exactly, why they were so quick yeah, in indicting, yeah, in announcing the indictment. Uh, I have to say that since the invasion, the ICC has been, I mean, flooded with donations, uh, and which, which also shows that uh, there is this uh, support for the ICC, uh, that there is confidence in the ICC, and that uh, uh, ICC is uh, an institution uh, uh, here to stay, in spite of the fact that the big powers are not uh, uh, are not endorsing it. Yeah? Uh, then I think um, the war in Ukraine is uh, a golden opportunity to think a little bit more creatively how we combine. Um, transitional justice methods of, of different sorts, at uh, different levels, uh, and we combine national and international efforts uh, in, uh, in um, um, redressing the legacy of these uh, human rights uh, um, abuses. And also it's a, it's a golden opportunity to involve Ukrainians uh, in, this, uh, in this whole process. Yeah, and again, transitional justice has been criticized 
um, over years that uh, not enough has been done, including by people like myself who are um, travelers from case to case. I've been involved with Iraq. I've been involved with uh, North Korea. I've been involved. Uh, we are we are bust from. I've been involved with uh, uh, the Arab Spring. So we are bust from case to case, and we speak our mind. We you know we prepare, but sometimes we are way off mark. Why? Because we really don't know. We have to all our. Um, um, you know, um, suggestions should be filtered through a local lens. So now what I want to do is to answer three things. Yeah. Which goals? So what the heck do we want to do with this transitional justice? Yeah. Uh, which courts? If we are to use courts, and definitely we are using it because uh, um, Putin is uh, already indicted, and which other transitional justice mechanisms I think uh, are are um, opportune and feasible in this um, uh, in this uh, respect. Um, transitional justice is predicated as a solution as a program that will deliver all or some of these truth, justice, reconciliation, and guarantees of non-repetition. It sounds better than it is in practice because uh, people will say, well, well, of course, we want to deliver all. Well, not necessarily uh, because there is a ranking. Sometimes one goal precludes another. Yeah, uh, and it's um, way more complicated than it's, uh, you would think uh, uh, at a superficial uh, type of uh, assessment. Yeah, uh, for example, um, uh, South Africa. Yeah, they had to close justice. They gave up uh, courts. Yeah, because they knew that for the type of crimes committed by the apartheid, the evidence you could collect was not good enough to get convictions in courts. Yeah? So South Africa conscientiously made the decision to say, I don't pursue justice. It's pointless. I, I will lose. I, I'll, yeah? I am pursuing truth. So this is why we have the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which had an amnesty subcommission in it, absolving people who come out with the truth from prosecution in the courts. So you give me truth and I am protecting you from justice. I obtain truth at the expense of justice. And we have, I, I mean, uh, th there's a, a, a lot of discussion here, yeah? Um, we have to tailor it very carefully because it seems to me that we will not be able to deliver all, yeah. Uh, in because we we have a war situation, I think guarantees of non-repetitions come first. Uh, truth, we have truth, yeah. Justice is called by the Ukrainians, yeah. Reconciliation is the most elusive. If you look at if you look at Canada, if you look at Australia, because Canada regardless of what Canadians are saying, is uh, the third case. Yeah, there was the stolen generation first. There was the Waitangi Tribunal in uh, uh, New Zealand. So we come, we come at the end of some similar processes in the world. And in all of them, reconciliation, including the South Africa, reconciliation is the hardest to get, yeah? And it takes far too long than any government has uh, patience to stick around, yeah? So um, uh, I think that uh, realistically speaking, we will get more truth and justice. We, we might get some uh, guarantees of non-repetition and reconciliation, this is an Eastern European case. I'm coming from there. The, these people cannot be taught anything. Yeah, so they, they will keep doing whatever 
and we have an Albanian here. Yeah, so it's like, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they will keep doing what they are doing and it's no way, no amount of sacrifices and no amount of education will really um, help us get there. When it comes to... Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, it, when it comes to courts, there is a huge discussion here because, because um, we have to think first which law we have to apply. Huh? So in civil war, national law applies. Yeah? But in this situation, we have a war between states. And I have to say, that this is not, I was asked uh, at a, an American university, uh, isn't this uh, Nuremberg trial, isn't this uh, uh, international criminal uh, tribunal for Rwanda and uh, Yugoslavia? No, no, because the Nuremberg trial was a military thing. Yeah, Tokyo trial, Nuremberg trial, those are military things, yeah? We are not in that situation, not yet, yeah? And definitely we are not in the situation with the ad hoc international criminal courts because those were in country. The Rwandan genocide was in the country. The Yugoslav wars were in the country, not country to country. They were not defined legally. Uh, country to country, yeah? So um, because this is a war between states, the national law will be set aside, yeah? Um, jus ad bellum, yeah? Uh, refers to the conditions under which states may resort to war, yeah? The United Nations Charter of 1945 uh, sets out the prohibition against the use of force again among states, and also the two exceptions to this thing, yeah? You are, you can wage war on the others, yeah? In two very specific um, uh, cases, yeah? First of all, in self-defense, and second of all, if you have UN authorization for the use of force. Russia is in none of these situations, yeah? Then use in bello during the war, yeah? is defined as the conduct and responsibilities of belligerent nations, neutral nations and individuals engaged in armed conflict in relation to each other and to protected persons. Yusin Bello tries to limit the consequences of armed conflicts on non-combatants, including vulnerable groups like women, children, um, uh, the wounded, uh, on the property and on the environment. Treatment of prisoners of war is also guided by these rules used in Bello. Russians are bound by human rights law in the Ukrainian territories they occupy. They have to make sure that prisoners of war get the treatment that they are, uh, that, that's stipulated by international um, uh, law, yeah. <laughs> then use post bellum, uh, that's uh, after the war, yeah? uh, refers to international criminal law uh, where uh, you have the possibility to characterize these crimes as um, unprescriptable uh, crimes, so not uh, under the statute of limitations as genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or the crime of aggression. Uh, and also refers to international law of reparations, yeah? to the extent that they will apply in this case. Now, the, of all of these, there is, there is a, a bit of a legal ar artifice. Yeah? Why? Because when ICC was created, Remember, it come, ICC comes as, in, as, as the UN reaction to two ad hoc tribunals that were extremely expensive may, uh, uh, set up in the 1990s. Yeah? And the UN says, it, it's, uh, yeah, you look at the $1 billion for 61 uh, uh, convictions, that, that's ridiculous. Yeah? And they, uh, it took them uh, um, 15, uh, almost 20 years. 
this is this is this is, this should not happen but because i see see the un when it discussed the rome statute it looked at the two ad hoc tribunals yeah actually it looked at two in the country conflicts yeah so icc has jurisdiction as miraculous or stupid you can want to label it over genocide war crimes crimes against against uh, humanity but not the crime of aggression now you you think you think but we have you look you look at nuremberg trial for god's sake crime of aggression was on the books well there was something else in the books in the uh, nuremberg trials that we don't do uh, today yeah we do not prosecute organizations the nazi organization was one of the defendants we are not doing that any longer i always ask my uh, because i'm not a lawyer yeah i always ask the international lawyers but why not you know why do we why we don't have the crime of aggression for icc why we don't prosecute uh, organizations because i think there is a warner group in toto should be yeah uh, and why do we use today stalin's definition of the genocide yeah because the american proposal for the genocide in the nuremberg trial included all the categories that are there and you can google for them on wikipedia plus plus yeah social economic groups and political groups and stalin said just a second we we delete this but of course you delete because the great error igor yeah that would be the first case that the nuremberg trial could <laughs> should have looked at yeah <laughs> and stalin said yeah but but we we have this legacy in other words yeah legally we we carry with us remnants and we have to deal with them and you look at all the uh, discussion in the in the news yeah is like everybody is like but where is the crime of aggression yeah where is the crime of aggression you know I'm, the where the heck are the lawyers to, you know you should be more careful with these things yeah we are just political uh, uh, science uh, people here yeah we don't take responsibility but the international lawyers should be smarter yeah more applied to these cases yeah um you know um we don't have it we don't have it uh but uh every i mean since uh, uh september was the first time i went uh, uh, uh there are international conferences yeah uh, talking about these things and um, um every lawyer international law person i talked to uh were saying was saying well <laughs> the crime of aggression is the crime the mother of all crimes because if we can deploy the crime of aggression meaning you uh, it's it's demonstrated at the at the top level yeah it's demonstrated at the top command level in the country meaning you are grabbing putin you cannot demonstrate crime of aggression without implicating the top person yeah and this is one so we got it we got him yeah with with the crime of aggression if we can have it anywhere in any court yeah and the se the second is that crime of aggression is tied in the international uh, treaties to state to state reparations and from state to state reparations you can then move state to individual state to group yeah you you can you can cons, uh, build cases so that you obtain reparations and many um, uh, the the ukrainian government and many in the international community are saying well this uh, war is so destructive uh for ukraine that they they will need money to reconstruct and the the uh, it is only normal 
for the Russians to pay the bill. Yeah. Um, so now that I talked a bit about the law, the real question is which court? Yeah. And here is like, uh, you see that you see that uh, some choices have already been uh, made, yeah? Uh, 20, 28th of February um, uh, last year, the ICC prosecutor opened an investigation into war crimes and crimes against humanity. War crimes are related directly. You can demonstrate a relation to the war crimes against humanity, not necessarily, but both, uh, not necessarily related to the war, um, but, but both of them are imprescriptible crimes. Yeah, you don't have uh, a certain number of years to prosecute them, yeah. Then on the 17th of March, 2023, the ICC issued a warrant for the arrest of Vladimir Putin and the arrest of uh, Maria uh, Lvova Belova, uh, who is Russia's commissioner for civil, uh, children's rights, yeah. Uh, which is kind of uh, an uh, ironical, <laughs> yeah? Is that she, she, is, she is supposed to protect children's rights and she is the uh, person instrumental in Russia, uh, directly implicated in moving uh, around 16,000 uh, uh, children from occupied Ukraine into uh, Russia with no consent uh, some of them were, were taken from uh, orphanages and uh, state institutions, but uh, some of them were not. Uh, no consent whatsoever, but also once they arrived in uh, Russia, they were put uh, uh, for adoption and adopted by Russian, of course, Russian good, good, uh, good standing uh, families. Again, with no, no regard for uh, consent or whatever they, the children went. So, so um, the ICC um, already um, um, issued this uh, warrant. Um, and and this, is, this is interesting uh, to me, yeah? Uh, why of everything that happens in, Ukraine, yeah, they didn't, uh, um, they didn't issue a warrant related to Bucha, yeah, they issued a warrant related to the one topic that is close to anybody's heart, correct? And that's, again, it shows you that ICC will always have to you know, uh, to, to balance the, the need to show effectiveness through action, yeah? Labeling uh, different, uh, different situations as situations, uh, 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 indicting people, uh, issuing, mo moving the case along the legal, uh, yeah? And also uh, gaining the, the trust and the support of the of the international community pretty much because without without this support icc will not be able to continue uh, its activity yeah okay and in uh, mid march so uh, two three weeks ago icc announced plans to address russia's attacks on civilian infrastructure water supplies gas and power plants not considered legitimate military targets outside of the war area. So again, you, uh, for me at least, I see that ICC is, is moving along, yeah? Uh, but probably it needs more time to make, to, to, to gather the evidence needed to go to the heart of the problem and the heart of the problem is the war itself it's bucha is the the heavy cases not that i'm not saying that the children is not a heavy case i'm saying that it's a case probably more more uh, uh, close to the heart of the general public than bucha would be um 
Now, okay, ICC has moved, has uh, 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 involved itself in some action, but ICC is limited. Yeah? Uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, are not signatories of the Rome Statute. Uh, Ukraine gave ICC, so since the invasion in February 2020, uh, 2022, um, uh, the Zelensky government gave two letters to ICC telling ICC that uh, it, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian ju uh, justice system relinquishes some cases to the ICC. The ICC can move yeah, in this jurisdiction, although Ukraine didn't sign, is not a signatory of the Rome Statute. And we know that the ICC can act yeah, only in the, in the uh, signatory states yeah, and only for crimes that take place after the ICC was set up. Yeah, these are these are in in its structure as an international uh, uh, court. Uh, ICC has no power of arrest, and uh, we know this that this is a big limitation from previous cases heard by ICC. ICC has no police, has nobody to uh, after uh, to, to arrest the person after the. Uh, warrant is issued yeah they have to rely on the member states to, to do these uh, arrests icc uh, works on based on the com, uh, uh, complementarity uh, principle which means you cannot dump all your cases court cases in an international court icc is the top up icc is the complement the stuff, the cases that take place in the national courts. Yeah? And you will see in the news, there is a lot of talk coming from ICC that uh, just a second, we, we shouldn't interpret uh, complementarity so strictly. Uh, we are talking here about uh, collaboration with the national. So kind of they want to erode that border so that they have the possibility to draw more cases than in other situations into the international court. But the international court was not created by the international community for uh, uh, countries in worse situations or, or in any type of dire situation to dump all their cases in the international court. That's, that's not to be done. That's not a good uh, signal for, for anybody. And that's that's... That's uh, the basis for the complementarity principle. The ICC also is remote. And the more we will uh, advance with these cases at the ICC, ICC will see the top, the top defenders, yeah? that, like the, the highest echelons. But the more we will see uh, these court proceedings evolve, the more we will hear accusations because we've heard them already in other in other situations that icc is remote that ukrainians cannot participate russians don't know what happens there is no educational value and we know that court trials also educate they educate the population don't do this do this yeah this is a good person this is not a good person this is a victim this is not a victim. yeah and icc also has no jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. This is why, yeah, when it comes to courts, I think it is time for all of us yeah, to think about the fact that the ICC is the fashionable, sexy, international diva type of court, yeah? But it's not, even in the best of circumstances, in the best of circumstances, not even 5% of the cases will be, will be heard by the ICC. So um, it, it's, it's the, the, uh, more and more attention is given uh, these days to the fact that the Ukrainian judiciary 
which will be the main locus of indicting, prosecuting, hearing, convicting, uh, arresting, yeah, the, the perpetrators of uh, related to the war, they will have to take the, the responsibility for this. In a war situation, what happens? Your courts are in disarray. Yeah, you lose some judges because they are killed. You lose some judges because they are refugees in, you know, Romania or whatever. So uh, uh, the the Zelensky government, you know, with the in a war situation, it takes sometimes. I mean, takes a, a liberal approach to law. I would say, yeah. Well, rule of law and the capacity of the. Uh, Ukrainian courts to do their job and to prosecute the bulk, what will be the bulk of these uh, cases is very important. Yeah. So up to now, we know that uh, uh, there are 71,000 allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity and other serious offenses related to the war. Uh, 26 conviction, convictions were obtained already in the Ukrainian courts. Uh, but there is a, short, a shortage of judges, lack of financial resources, uh, uh, the crucial, crucial judicial governance bodies. This is the council of the magistrate that vets the, 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 the personnel in the judiciary is not working properly and it's too close to the executive. So uh, there, are, there are issues uh, here in um, uh, uh, with with respect to how uh, rule of law will be uphold, yeah, and uh, um, because uh, there is uh, there has been a bit of a confusion uh, whether the death penalty was abolished or not, because some people were rejoicing we are we are getting to Putin and now we apply. Yeah, we applied the death penalty because Ukraine doesn't have the death penalty any longer. Yeah, so we cannot do that as we were able to do to Saddam. Um, besides uh, the ICC and the uh, national Ukrainian courts, there are other, other court proceedings, uh, judici judicial uh, uh, mechanisms that we are uh, we can look at. Yeah, uh, there is a proposal on the table for a new international court to be constituted uh, that will look at the crime of aggression. Many people are saying this should be just a chamber of the ICC. Yeah, to, to that thing. Yeah, so it it could be a footnote to the ICC, yeah? Uh, we will see how, uh, how uh, it uh, unfolds because the thing is with international courts, you need the UN support, yeah? ICC needed, needed UN support. Now, it's, uh, it's the situation is volatile and uh, it's not uh, really um, evident that uh, the crime of aggression will, uh, uh, will be assigned uh, to a new international court. Yeah? Uh, if the crime of aggression, as I said, uh, uh, if we can use it and if we characterize, if we, if we have the evidence necessary to characterize the crimes committed in, in Ukraine as part of a crime of aggression, then kind of, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, good consequences uh, will ensue. Um, another possibility, and this uh, has been proposed by, um, um, uh, by the legal community in Europe, a hybrid court. Uh, to um, get away from uh, the uh, charges uh, addressed to international court, that they are remote, that they are uh, complementarity, all, all of these uh, limitations, yeah, you can address uh, with the creation of a new hybrid, a hybrid court. My personal opinion is that there will be very difficult, it will be very difficult to create new institutions in this I mean, we will have to wait for the end of the war uh, to have them. I don't, I don't see them as the 
uh, as the conflict unfolds, not yet, yeah? And then we have another legal artifice around, uh, uh, starting the year 2000, universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction means that courts in Canada, for example, could invoke universal jurisdiction if, of course, you have to have the evidence, yeah? Uh, and if Putin comes to a conference uh, in Ottawa, you which, which happens, and I'm not, we have two cases, yeah? The guy very nicely went to Denmark, uh, for a uh, you know top level uh, yeah and uh, the um, once he arrived in Denmark the Dan Danish police said just a second universal jurisdiction so he couldn't go back to his uh, dictatorial country yeah and uh, uh, so we can do that and it's what's interesting is that 21 countries now <laughs> it's like a, it's like a competition yeah in a way in a way, I'm looking at this, comparing with everything that I know from other cases, and it's like, chill, chill out. Uh, uh, these uh, overlapping jurisdictions uh, competing with each other, and, and uh, if too many, uh, think about this, if too many courts and, and investigative teams are going into Ukraine, you are spoiling the evidence. You, that, that, that's not to be done. So please take a break, you know, kind of let's think about it. Yeah, let's think about it a little bit more rather than jumping to, I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, of course we want, we want to get to them, you know, and to get to them sooner rather than later, but it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see that transitional justice is so popular in the world, yeah? Uh, but then we have even more because to a certain extent, to me, all these discussions revolving court trials are uh, uh, too narrow, yeah? We, we have a lot, a lot more to offer in transitional justice when it comes to, to getting to, 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 to getting to them, to documenting their their uh, wrongdoings, to, to to make to to, cl to clarify what's uh, what's uh, going on there. Yeah, um, there is a um, uh, UN panel of inquiry. Uh, this is a useful exercise. It's not a judicial. Uh, it, it's akin to an international trust commission. I've been involved, I was an advisor to the UN panel, uh, um, 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 panel of inquiry uh, for uh, North Korean uh, human rights violations with Michael Kirby from Australia uh, as, as the head of, uh, of uh, that panel, yeah? These are good, but um, uh, they are very, high level, top level type of, they are good to, uh, to raise awareness about the war and about the crimes at the international level and to feed the UN with uh, the material needed for resolutions for uh, other, other things. I don't think they are, they are too top, yeah? To, they, they miss a lot of detail. So this is why I'm saying that uh, methods that, that go closer, uh, uh, come down from, from moon to closer, closer to the ground are, are um, more uh, what, I'm, what I'm looking uh, at, yeah? Truth projects, uh, uh, official and unof unofficial, are also uh, very important. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, citizens' opinion tribunals, um, in case uh, the Russian uh, uh, government doesn't uh, want to take any kind of action, you can set up these mock, mock tribunals uh, to, um, uh, to raise awareness again. And then we have forensic investigations. This is a huge area of transitional justice with how you, how you document every body uh, that you find, all the remains, all the... Um, and also 
um, once the conflict is over, I think Ukraine has to rethink its lustration uh, lustration program because it was um, uh, it was um, uh, focusing on uh, on the uh, perpetrators of communist crimes, but it can be extended to the um, to the victimizers uh, that took place in the war in Ukraine. So pretty much this this is this is kind of my discussion of transitional justice uh, in uh, Ukraine with a plea with a plea uh, to consider um, um, uh, a mix of uh, methods that have been successful in other contexts. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much, Dr. Singer, for a fascinating <laughs> Uh, I'm Dr. Anna Kuchlev. I'm a border research manager at the Norman Institute. I'm happy to take comments for questions. Uh, really excellent talk and nice area to continue with. Um, one of the assumptions of the talk, though, or I was wondering, like, what happens if Russia wins? What happens to the idea of transition? Yeah, uh, but uh, um, then, yeah, look here, Russia, this is not the first set of human rights violations that Russia is not willing to look at. Yeah? Russia, for me, is the, when, I, when I'm talking about civil society in, uh, in uh, a transitional justice context, I always talk about Russia. Because Russia, when it comes to the communist past, didn't do anything. Gorbachev, uh, Yeltsin, Putin, zero. The only thing that happens as transitional justice in Russia is memorial society. Yeah? So what for, for me, if Russia wins means that the borders of a country that is inimical to my projects yeah, will be extended with a territory where I already documented crimes. Will they be more willing to redress the legacy of the war in Ukraine as compared to communism? No. No, this is why I didn't, I didn't include the Russian courts. Actually, actually, if you think about it, the other big box here, yeah, that I didn't, the, the Russian courts, the Russian courts should, because actually there is much more action outside of the purview of proportional, you know, all those principles of law, of uh, war that happen in Ukraine already, yeah? So Russia could activate its judiciary, and it it will. Ne I I don't even have it on the table because I know it will not take. So it's like, yeah, Russia won't do anything. This doesn't mean that I, outside of it, will not do anything. So is it as as uh, effective as uh, if it was done in the territory? No, no. Yeah, but we have so many other uh, instances when the international community, yeah, and here you have a, 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 an aggrieved sovereign rest of country, yeah, Ukraine will be a rest, a remainder, yeah, a, a botched country, yeah, or, or do you think that it will be wiped out uh, by the by the by Russia? It depends how they win, you know, because they could win with a total. Take take of the territory, or just and I I think they want only the east, and 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 for their uh, own purposes, the east the east is pro Russian. The east is majority Russian speaker. Yeah, what the heck would Russia do with a West Ukraine that is inimical to their project, that is pro European, that is. Uh, speaking Ukraine, that is, uh, you know, has all this uh, um, history uh, around Kievan Hus, which is not the Russian take on Kievan Hus. So why would you want to 
incorporate that territory into your country because you'll have only problems. Yeah. So yes, that's that's a very very likely possibility that whatever they uh, uh, Luhansk, uh, Donbas, Crimea will stay in Russia. Yeah, that's, I, I, I think it's, it's very likely. Um, uh, can we have transitional justice about the, the crimes done there and the crimes done outside of those territory in Ukraine? After that win, yes, of course, full force. Thank you. That's wonderful. Very enlightening. Um, I just was kind of intrigued by one of the comments that you said the ICC is getting a lot of donations now for job training. Um, and that this is the first non African uh, yeah. context. So, is there a racial lens that can be applied to some of this work in that you got you know, this kind of white population yeah. war? So, then we're going to kind yeah. of put our money there where we weren't going to yeah, do it. Yeah, very much so. And, and these, these were the criticisms uh, I, I found about the donations because I found about the criticism, like, oh my God, this is the first time we are uh, looking at uh, white people and uh, yeah, money is pouring so that we are, money is pouring so that we get these people, not to help them, yeah? to do justice because money is pouring to, to find these white people bad, yeah, to demonstrate they are bad. So yes, of course, it's, uh, I, I think ICC will not move that quickly away from the legacy of Luis Moreno Ocampo. I really like the guy. I mean, good looking. Uh, do, did you see on YouTube? On YouTube, you can Google one day in the life of Luis Moreno Ocampo when he was prosecutor general. This is the, the young prosecutor in the only trial in Latin America, the trial of the juntas. Yeah, because in, as, as uh, Lemke in, uh, in the Nuremberg trial, yeah, who, who accepts to be prosecutor? Only young people who have no career to, to put on the line, correct? So, uh, uh, and, and it happened to him, really, this is, this is a reality, yeah? He was a nobody, a, no, a, a, a grad, uh, you know, grad school guy just uh, uh, fresh off the, yeah? He gets this case because nobody wanted to touch it. The case is successful overnight. Luis Moreno Ocampo is like, Wow, yeah, and this is why, I mean, the guy is larger than life, but this larger than life, and, and for very good reason, I'm, I don't want to criticize him, you know, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a, a very big supporter and I, I, I understand where he's coming from, you know? He had, uh, think about him, you know, the first prosecutor general that you are ex establishing an institution when you have the big players, saying the nastiest things about you. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was cut and undermined yeah? from, from US, from Russia, from China, from, we know, we know, yeah? So in those limitations, I think he did quite a lot, but uh, he was grander than life. This is a Hollywood type of personality. Yeah, and then uh, when when he got out of the ICC, the prosecutor, the other, the the personnel, the, the staff there wrote a, a letter. Yeah, published a letter. This guy, you know, comes here. I mean, you could see the tension within the institution between this guy who had his own agenda to. Uh, and and the other people who are disagreeing uh, disagreeing with him uh, and and getting vetoed by him yeah this is not he is not like let's let's uh, discuss and let's be friends no I'm the boss you you do what I'm telling you so uh, all of that this comes came as a legacy. 
fatwa Ben Saur, the, the, the African woman who was uh, uh, his successor, and the, the present guy. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a heavy legacy. Uh, it, it will it will only time only time only by doing ICC in time will prove that it will. Uh, it is doing what it is meant to do. Will there will always be people who will look at the patterns and will say, "To this, to that." Uh, yeah, they 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 cannot get away with it. Uh, the uh, uh, for me, the ICC, the the miracle with ICC is not that it is biased. The miracle with ICC is it. It's it's still around. It's still around. It, despite everything, this in spite of everybody, the ICC is healthy, moving on, full speed, with the attitude. We'll we'll get to you. We'll show you. I I think that's uh, after after twenty years to have this courage. This is remarkable, Igor. <laughs> The software. Uh, would the, the legitimacy of the ICC, this is just a broader question beyond the Ukrainian conflict, wouldn't the legitimacy of the ICC and some of the practical issues and constraints that you've raised, many of them would be addressed or at least regressed to a great extent if countries like the US, Western countries, become signatories? So what's stopping them? The 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 renditions, yeah. uh, Guantanamo yeah. stops yeah. it. Yeah. We know, we know we can. Yeah. But wouldn't it, you know, if we're committed to yeah, the yeah. universality, maybe there should be a push to get the US, Israel, and the other countries, yeah. you know, to yeah. China. China, exactly. The we we goes yeah. The liberal, you know, allowed liberal democratic human rights loving uh, countries yeah. to start living up to their principle of commitment. So I, I agree. Think, I think that would help the ICC a lot. Not yeah. only in this context, but I think more generally. Yeah. Uh, with transition, that's, yeah. that's on the way to be. But the, the US is in a binding situation. Yeah. Because by the time, uh, and by the way, renditions, a lot of the renditions were done in unmarked planes that were, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, were parked where? In the Czech Republic. And Romania, huh? Yeah. So I mean, uh, uh, and I, I have, I have, uh, and uh, friends in Bucharest, uh, uh, we uh, photograph, uh, yeah, with photographs of the of the planes. Everybody knew, everybody uh, unmarked plane on the, uh, yeah, on the Bonessa tarmac. Yeah, you, you, we already knew what the all of those happened after 1998, after the Rome Statute. So uh, US, US, unless it, it gets a promise that is not, I, I don't think them, I don't think, be, because there are so many people who want to get them. Mm -hmm. huh? Another another possibility, and that's that's uh, uh, transitional justice is good and uh, you know uh, uh, how to say interesting, yeah. But uh, uh, biology beats us. Huh? If people die, huh? then all this we we go home because all of this is theoretical. All of this uh, uh, is pushed into the realm of history. Historians in the history department are not doing what I'm doing. And I'm, I always say that that's, so for dead people, that's another, that's another thing. That's another, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not involved with that. So if, uh, if, uh, if Putin dies, you know, or if, uh, if the Guantanamo rendition, you know, if we have the victims and victimizers not around, then our the, the the case against the US weakens 
And then that might be a window of opportunity if Putin dies and uh, you know all the all the minister of foreign affairs or uh, Lebeda, whatever her name, uh, yeah, with the children, uh, then that creates problems for us because we are not in the in the business of uh, prosecuting dead, dead people. Oh, anti anti pope, yeah. Steve was uh, here, <laughs> Steve Balner, yeah. With so, uh, once upon a time, we were digging up the pope, yeah. We were declaring him anti pope, yeah. But we are not in that business uh, any longer. Jim, I mean, I understand from you the transition of justice from comments to post processes for indigenous peoples in Canada or New Zealand, it's from colonial to post-colonial. What's this transition? From uh, war to peace, from conflict war to, peace. to peace. But then it's that really watering down the original sense of what transition of justice was about, no. was about one regime to another. No, no, actually it started with conflict to peace. And then it moved into dictatorship to democracy. Yeah. yeah. So, but and actually, is... Nuremberg, excuse me, Nuremberg trial, which yeah. is our this is ground zero. Justice, though. This is like transitional justice just becomes international justice. No, no. It's not a special. No, because we are not into justice only, and we are not into international or only. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it still seems to me like you're <laughs> pushing the boundaries of transitional justice up now to cover a whole lot more than it was sort of originally. No, no, no. Uh, uh, co conflict to peace and dictatorship to democracy, these are established. So uh, 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 Nuremberg trials and Tokyo trials and uh, class B and C, uh, uh, everything having to do with the uh, um, uh, fascists, Nazis, uh, uh, Second World War, that's squarely transitional justice. Yeah, uh, everything uh, to do with uh, Latin American uh, military uh, junta regimes, the democracy, uh, South Africa, uh, apartheid. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's what I mean. Those things, yes. The, uh, part, part of. They didn't call it transitional justice back then. No, no, no. I mean, no. 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 But but uh, but uh, just a second, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, it, it's I a, no no no. I I know. This I, is your field. So I no no no. Like, but you uh, this is this is this is actually a problem we have yeah. because transitional justice per se, yeah, appears in 1993. Neil Kritz, this guy, uh, edits three huge volumes of. Uh, uh, legislation around the world. And he says, this is, this is justice in transition. And then Ruti Taitel comes with a book with Oxford University Press in 2000. And he, she says, because she's a lawyer, yeah? She says, look here, courts in normal times do this, but then in transition from peace to, uh, from conflict to peace and dictatorship to democracy, on top of rapes and killings and murders and uh, killing the goat and uh, yeah they do these these things that are in trend uh, uh, characteristic of transition but what they were meaning was political transition regime change to, to confuse you even more yeah Canada what the heck Canada Canada is one of our shining examples of transitional justice with the uh, TRC. And whenever people ask me, I say it's a change in mentality. Because I cannot say it's a, it was a uh, democracy before, during, and after. Yeah, or uh, stolen generations inquiry with the uh, aborigines. Well, colonialist lens, if you were doing that, you'd say you know, colonialist, post colonialist. What colonialism and post-colonial? How do you? Well, yeah, that's that's yeah, but it's that that's the transition there. If you're yeah yeah yeah, 
uh, uh, now we confused everybody, yeah? Because, because uh, so we, we have this inherent problem in transitional justice because the term appears very late, yeah? And actually we are now putting it before transitional justice was around as a term, yeah? The Germans had Vergangen, whatever, any German? Vergangen and, uh, and Geschichte uh, coming through the, his, coming, uh, 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 muddling through history and uh, coming to terms with history, yeah? So we are applying, but the, but the thing is that transitional justice is not about transition only, and it's not about justice only. Yeah, when when I edited the first uh, uh, version, the first uh, edition of the encyclopedia, the first thing we did, yeah, and it was like uh, the encyclopedia is three. Now is the the second edition, yeah. But the first edition, Cambridge University Press, two thousand and thirteen, like two hundred and something contributors around the world. The second edition is almost 400 con uh, contributors around the world. The first thing we did was to quarrel about transitional justice because one it's thing, one, one thing it was clear, we don't like it. We don't like it. What the heck is, what the heck is this? It's, it doesn't represent us. And we, we quarreled nicely, you know? And then the conclusion was, at least we know what we are talking about, and we have nothing smart to. <laughs> so... uh, according to the lawyers that I met, uh, yes, that this is the first. Uh, uh, interstate full-blown conflict that we are witnessing and we are, before we are asked to, uh, to, to implement transitional justice, we are recognizing it as a transitional justice case. So then your theory would be that, I'm assuming your theory would be that this should contribute either to an earlier piece. No. Or to a, 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 a resolution never to do more again. Uh, yeah, uh, guarantees of non-repetition. That would be that if we if we illustrate, if we prosecute, if we if we squeeze them well. I don't think it's within our purview. Of saying that, well, you know. Maybe we cannot he, get at him. He's not the kind of person who's going to be intimidated by the yeah. threat of uh, the international criminal court, but, but somebody under him might be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I've been involved with, the, with North Korea. Also, uh, uh, I mean, nice uh, exercise. Uh, we were brought to South Korea. Uh, UN is very generous with alcohol. I have to say, you know, I mean, really, I, we were put in Sheila Hotel. You should ask a young one, young one when he's, my God, Sheila Hotel, you know, I mean, lots of uh, money. Um, if you cannot get to them because uh, it, it, uh, you, it, we are useless, transitional justice is useless to solve your security problem. This is not the first case. Uh, Arab, Arab Springs, I, I, I've been involved with Arab Springs. Actually, Libya. I, I was, I was uh, they, they assigned me to the um, uh, Minister of Interior, the new Minister of Interior of Libya. I had this whole project to publish in foreign affairs. I mean, you, you know, and it's like they are, it's, it's a mess. It, 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 so I would have to say that, uh, Maybe 90% uh, of the cases I've been involved uh, are failed cases. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, well, on that option, <laughs> um, I would like to protect you just a little. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Oh. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, look thank at this. Thank you very much for everyone for coming.
happening. It's not only presently snow, but it is also the last day of class. Uh, so thank you. Um, I would like to put everyone on notice though. Next year, I probably will invoke your universal jurisdiction to get people to come to our events. For the so just be aware, you will, you're on notice. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, no problem at all. <laughs> Nice to see you. Well, you just feel like that's great.